symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. As cold as a razor blade, as tight as a tourniquet, like the skin on a dying man. I don't want a piece of the world. I want the whole world. I make my own rules because it's much easier that way. Trust me. What's up, everybody? It's Marcus D'Angelo, and we are back for another episode of The Snake Pit. And of course, I am joined by the Hall of Famer himself, the man, the master of the DDT, Jake the Snake Roberts. Jake, how are you, brother? Uh, in shock. Yes. In shock. Uh, um, so just so you guys know, right here before we start recording, I informed Jake about the uh, John Laronitis situation. And, uh, you know, for those of you who are not up to snuff on what's going on, you know, the, the talk about this Vince McMahon lawsuit has been everything in professional wrestling recently between that and Cody and The Rock. I mean, that's that's all that anybody's been talking about. And another interesting development was that Vince's co-defendant and longtime WWE executive John Laurinaitis is now claiming that he is also a victim in the sexual abuse and trafficking lawsuit. Uh, Jake, I have never met Johnny, but I know that you likely spent time around him and certainly got to spend your fair share of time around his brother, Joe, who is uh, yeah. a little warrior animal. Yeah. Uh, Jake, what, what do you make of this new development? It blows my mind. Uh, it sounds to me like he might be, t- be trying to protect his butt. Man, it's it feels like uh, throwing up a Hail Mary. I mean, you know, getting named yeah. in a lawsuit like this is holy shit, man. That is you uh, know, not just career altering, life altering stuff. Yeah, it is, man. And, and now, Jake, I've heard mixed things about Johnny over the years. Uh, mm-hmm. What would you say your experience around him have been like? I wasn't around him at all. No. No. Okay. Not at all. So I met him a couple of times, you know. Uh, okay. Later on, after I'd already left the WWF, the WWE, but uh, I was never around him. All right. Well, so I know his brother. Was Joe a high character guy? Yeah, he was a character. (laughs) Did he have, uh, I mean, so the rumor about Joe has always been that he was kind of the one who kept the road warriors between the the white lines, essentially, where Hawk was a little bit more of the party guy and stuff. I mean, Joe, Joe, uh, like moral compass sort of a dude. Yeah. Yeah. To a point. Man, it's a it's a weird t- topic to to discuss, certainly. And, uh, you know, Jake, I know that on, on our last episode, when you talked about Vince, uh, it, a lot of fans were really happy with the fact that you didn't soft shoe this thing. You were very no. straightforward about it, where like a lot of people are sort of dancing around it. Nobody wants to commit one way or the other. You were just yeah. you. That's that's what I love about the snake pit, too. You're always just straightforward. You're always just Jake. Yeah. And uh, and that's that's what our fans can expect, you know, and I'm sure that there will be more developments as we go. And I'll I'm ask sure. you about them. So, hey, tell me about The Rock and uh, Cody Rhodes. What happened there? Oh, OK. So uh, Cody Rhodes, the whole thing has been that Cody's going to finish the story at WrestleMania. That was the story last year, too. And then he loses to Roman Reigns. So. For a full year, fans have been saying, like, okay, so next year Cody's going to get him. You know, they just wanted to get Roman to a thousand day reign. Now it's the next WrestleMania. It's happening this time. Cody's going to get him. Then Cody wins the Royal Rumble. So everybody's like, okay, it's happening. Everybody's getting all pumped up. And then (coughs) Seth Rollins comes out on TV and challenges Cody Rhodes um, to challenge him at WrestleMania for his world championship, not the WWE championship. And then The Rock steps into the picture with Roman Reigns. And Jake, to say that fans are up in arms about it uh, is an understatement. They were chanting Die Rocky Die like it was back in 1996 on a recent episode of Raw or SmackDown or something. Die Rocky Die? You, do you remember that? Back when Rock was like a rookie, they used to oh, chant yeah. that at him? Now they're doing it again all these years. Like the most beloved figure in all of entertainment uh, now the fans are chewing him up and spitting him out because they feel like Cody Rhodes got fucked in this whole thing. Oh, well. <laughs> I, I, I hate to say I told you so, but 
<laughs> now, there's there are two schools of thought when it comes to this whole thing, and I'm curious which one you fall under. Some people are saying like, hey, no, The Rock is the right choice for this because it's the whole head of the table thing, and also they're trying to rehabilitate WWE's issue, uh, you know, image, and how better to do that than with a guy who's the biggest movie star in the world. On the other side, fans are saying like, hey, you can't do this to Cody. We want Cody. Uh, Cody's our guy. He's the future of WWE. Where do you stand on it, Jake? I th- definitely think he's the future. You know, it's time for Roman to step down. Uh, it's been time, I think, mm-hmm. for him to step down. And uh, it's just a shame. that why do, they, why do all the good guys get fucked? Yep. You know, seems to me. And uh, Cody's worked hard, very, very hard. He's worked through injuries. He's worked through sickness. He's worked through it all. And still goes out there and performs unbelievably. And uh, for him to get the snafu again, that's going to leave a nasty taste in people's mouth. And, uh, you know, I could see him boycotting mania. I could see it too. Um, I mean, they're already, I mean, when you, when the rock after years of being this huge fan favorite and every time he returns, the fans lose their minds when, when the fans are spitting him back up. Yeah. Man, it tells you something. Yeah. They're going to have to do something there. They're going to have to rethink it. Rumor has it that, you know, between now and WrestleMania, maybe the, uh, the gears are turning there in corporate where they're like, okay, maybe we need to turn this thing around. So we'll yeah. see. I, I think before it's over, Cody, you'll get it. I hope so. He certainly does deserve it. And he's yeah. he's one of those guys in wrestling today that feels like he's he's uh he's got that old school flavor to him. Yep, he can do a lot of the new cool, fun, you know, exciting yeah. stuff, but he's also got like the pacing and the style yeah. and the ability to sell like an old school guy. Yeah, he still knows how to wrestle. Absolutely. Man, he's fun to watch. And we're having fun here on the Snake Pit. This week, Jake, uh we yeah. are picking back up where we left off. Uh, at the end of your time in WCCW, when all of a sudden you made the choice, I'm going to return to Bill Watts and Mid South Wrestling. Yeah, <laughs> just a glutton for punishment. <laughs> we'll get into that here a little bit. Uh, but first off, you know, we left off this story. Um, uh, you were on your way out the door at WCCW, of course, and you had made a call to Bill Watts about returning to his territory. Mm-hmm. Now. As a reminder to fans, you would come to WCCW 1984 and were immediately inserted into the top line creative there. You're teaming up with gentlemen Chris Adams and Gino Hernandez and working against Savon Eric. So on paper, a really good spot for you to be in. However, as you mentioned, uh, the top spot did not necessarily mean top money. And uh, you became frustrated in Dallas pretty quickly. Very frustrated. So, Jake, we've we've talked about money here before, and you even mentioned specifically that you were making maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of seven hundred dollars a week in WCCW. Yeah. yeah. Now that makes me wonder. Uh, you know, you had been to Mid South already, and had even been their North American champion. Then you yeah. went to Georgia. You're having great success there, yeah. helping on booking. Yeah. Uh, how would you compare the money across the territories at this time? Well, Bill Watts would double what WCCW had. Okay. And, of course, uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling would triple it. Wow. So that's where the money was. So thus far in your career, Georgia had been the best-paying territory yeah. you'd been to. Well, I was doing two jobs. I was booking and I was wrestling. Okay. Now, uh, before you began helping out with booking, was it closer to what Watts was paying? Yeah. Okay, so a little extra cheese on your Whopper to to help out with booking. Right. I well, didn't help uh, out with it. I was the only one doing it. That's right. And uh, interestingly, you know, I, I just was doing research for an episode with Ted, and I found the exact date that you had worked with Jerry Briscoe, and that decision yeah. was made. Um, so really neat to kind of look back and see all these pieces kind of uh, interconnect. Now, uh, how about travel? Up to this point in your career, which territory had the most grueling schedule? Oh, by far, Bill Watts. And now you're getting ready to go back into that buzzsaw. Yeah. Oof, man. Well, I mean, with the money, probably worth it. I'm sure that Cheryl was getting frustrated just right along with you. So she's like, yeah, get back on the road. 
Yeah, well, we just got married, you know, and all of a sudden there's no money. Oh, man. Uh, that wasn't a good feeling. Now, it, now, regardless of territory, whether it's Mid-South or, or elsewhere, all of the expenses on the road are on you guys, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, you had mentioned before that you're spending maybe about $100 a day, maybe a little bit more while you were in the WWF. Would you say it was comparable um, elsewhere? No, you didn't spend that much elsewhere. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe, what, twenty five fifty a day? Yeah. Yeah. So WWE, you spent more than 100 You spent probably 150 175 Holy shit. Well, you had to have a hotel room. And the rental car. And the rental car. And your food. Well, a rental car is going to cost you back then... 50, 60 bucks, a hotel, 75 and up. So figure it out. That's a lot of money flying out the door every year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. Now, uh, I'm curious. You had said that the money in WCCW is pretty bad, uh, pretty much from the start. But yeah. why hang in there for about six months? Were you hoping it was going to improve? I was hoping it would turn. Okay. Were you promised that it would along the way? Yes. By Fritz. Oh, yeah. As, man, I, I, good on you for trying to stick it out and believing in the guy. But, man, six months and it's like, okay, enough of that shit. Uh, yeah. Again, you're working at or near the top of the card in Dallas. So I'm wondering how Fritz took it whenever you did give your notice. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> I just you didn't tell him? Fuck. No. I told Ken Mantell. Okay. Ken Mantell was the booker. I just told him I couldn't do it any longer. So on your way out the door, uh, you you have no communication with Fritz. No. Man, you know, like in the in the Iron Claw movie, he's portrayed as like this very hard nosed, like got his fingers all through the, his business kind of guy. Was that not the reality? No. Okay, so like, how would he you had the business? It? He had the business on the claw, under the claw. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, that's a better way to put it. Yeah. How would you describe his personality? It seems like he was kind of detached from the product. He was cold. Okay. And detached, but he still had his hand on everything. Um, I think it's interesting to note that you're going to start back up with Mid-South on January 3rd in a match with Rocky King, but you're not done with WCCW yet. In fact, your last match with them, which we're going to be discussing here in a minute, is not until January 28th. So you're kind of working in both territories at this time. Um, is it just as simple as fulfilling final obligations with Fritz, yeah. or how did that work? Yeah, that was it. Okay. Now, I mean, you're getting paid then by two companies at the same time, which means yeah. you're, you've got to be making some pretty decent money then all of a sudden. So-so. Uh, I mean, you know, it's even so, it's like you've got to be making more than you would make in Mid-South because you're combining Mid-South with WCCW. Yeah. So it's yeah. like a nice, nice chunk of change. I mean, I, I know that these territories are not very far from each other. Um, and I think I know the answer to this, but it's worth asking. Would it have been possible for you to continue to work in both companies simultaneously? Absolutely not. Just due to the crazy travel? Yeah, yeah. No way in hell. So the expectations from Watts would have just been too heavy for you to Oh, balance. yeah. Yeah, Watts wouldn't do that. Okay. Um, well, you're leaving WCCW behind on a pretty high note. Your final match with the company is against the Freebirds, and uh, they are one of the most important acts in company history, and they're still viewed as an all-time great group. They're composed, of course, of Michael Hayes, Terry Bam Bam Gordy, and Buddy Jack Roberts, and they did some monster business. Uh, Hayes was always touted as being one of the more creative men in professional wrestling. Uh, what were your experiences like around Michael? Michael can create. He can do it. He's been doing it for years. To this day. Oh, yeah. Okay, guys. 2024 is in full swing, and that means it's time for a New Year's resolution check-in with our friends at Manscaped. Newsflash, it is never too late to level up your grooming game and keep your bush tamed. 
Manscaped's new Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is every man's cheat code to look good, feel good, and turn the page on confidence this year. Whether you're going for a trim or that clean shaven look, this trimmer has you covered. Trusted by over 10 million men worldwide, now is your time to get a grip on your grooming with our exclusive offer. You go to manscaped.com and use code SNAKEPIT, you'll save 20%, plus you'll get free shipping. The ball is dropped, but don't drop the ball on your balls. You know, 2023 was a very, very busy year. And in 2024, I think that we should all be looking to improve ourselves, right? You know, it's easy to get lazy. It's easy to just relax during your time off and just say, hey, I don't want to do anything. But why not take care of yourself and do your significant other a little favor with some help from Manscaped? Let's introduce the MVP of 2024, Manscaped's fifth generation lawnmower. It's not just a trimmer, it is your grooming sidekick. It's equipped with two skin-safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. It's like having a personal stylist at your fingertips or, you know, well, wherever else you want it. Hey, and did we mention that it's waterproof? Because let me say, guys, you want to cut down on that bathroom mess if you want to keep that significant other happy, and this is the way to do it. Take that thing in the shower, use it there, and wash all that hair down the drain. Boom, easy cleanup, problem solved. And by the way, if you want the full grooming experience, look no further than Manscaped's Performance Package 5.0. In this grooming kit, you get the trusted lawnmower, Manscaped's ear and nose hair trimmer, which believe me, as you get older, you are going to need, and essential aftercare products with the Crop Soother Ball Aftershave Lotion and Crop Preserver, anti-chafing ball deodorant. Yep, that's right deodorant for your balls because your armpits aren't the only place to need it as a gesture for the new year they even threw in two free gifts the boxers 2.0 and the shed 2.0 toiletry bag because manscape knows good and you're still rocking those boxers from high school don't lie we know that you are let's face it resolutions might come and go but a well-groomed you is here to stay thanks to manscaped Guys, it's time. Take that step and get 20% off and free shipping with the code SNAKEPIT at manscaped.com. It's a new year, guys, and it's time to embrace the new you and definitely embrace a new trimmer, courtesy of Manscaped. Uh, I mean, can you give us any specific examples of like what what kind of made him stand out as a creative mind in wrestling? He just put it together, man. You know, he'd come up with an idea and he knew how to work on it and piece it together and produce it. And uh, he also knew how to play the game with the office, mm. you know, which was more important with uh, the situation in Dallas. You know, he knew how to play those boys. Gotcha. So he kind of chummed up to the Von Ericks. And, oh, yeah. Uh, A big time. You kidding? I see. Now, uh, what about his ring work? What did you think of Michael in the ring? Okay, in the ring. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He wasn't great, <laughs> but he was okay. You know, it's uh, ordinarily what I hear about Michael is, you know, people will be like, oh, man, what a great creative guy. And then you say, like, well, how was he in the ring? And they're like, boy, was he creative. Really? Yeah. Creative <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> Uh, and, but you know, he didn't, he's one of those guys that really didn't need to be like a technician. It was all about personality with him, right? Yeah. It was all about the character, man. Now, like yourself, he's also considered a really great promo and a heat magnet. Uh, what do you think made him connect with the audience so well? He was so flamboyant, you know, the long blonde hair, that's such a heat getter, you know, pretty boy. You know, everybody feels like I whip his ass, you know, because I probably could. You know? <laughs> um, did you ever see the image of him with like the uh, the rebel flag and he's apparently nude under it? No. Oh, OK, well, if you're dying to see it, I'll fire it over to you. You have to but take yeah. it off the ceiling of your bedroom. <laughs> Jake, this is reminding me I was on Instagram recently and somebody uh, posted a picture and in the background, I saw this was a picture of themselves, a selfie in their bathroom. And in the background, I saw a picture of you hanging up in their bathroom, Jake. No shit. So, uh, <laughs> I just hope one day I'm famous enough that somebody hangs my picture in their shitter. Yeah, no shit. 
Uh, is it, when you hear that, is that like, hey, that's super flattering, or is it like, that doesn't oh, surprise me? <laughs> it's, I'm surprised I mean, they don't have it taped to the toilet seat. <laughs> so they can shit on me. I'm just picturing somebody like struggling to get it out, and then they're like, you know, yeah. Jake Roberts would fucking grit his teeth right now. Yeah, there you go. They can have, <laughs> have it taped to the bottom of the bowl. They can shit on me. <laughs> well, now you're giving me ideas. There you go. Uh, Terry Gordy is considered one of the most naturally gifted big men in wrestling history. Yeah. Uh, legit heavyweight who can move around like a gazelle. Um, yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about your experiences with Terry in and out of the oh, ring? Bam Bam was awesome, man. He was such a, such a gifted man. You know, and uh, he started in the business incredibly young. Mm. I think he was like 14. Damn. Yeah. I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah. 14. So, I mean, do you think it, it boils down to him being just a naturally gifted big guy, or was it like was he the beneficiary of all those years and years of learning? Well, years of work, too. But mm -hmm. you put those together, and then you throw Michael. But really, the key to that team was Buddy. Really? Buddy was the one that went out and did the, the grind work. You know, he went out and did the, the, the hard shit. You know, he's the one that went out and got bumped. You know, he didn't bump Michael around much till the, till the end of the match. Mm -hmm. And you damn sure didn't bump Bam Bam. You know, it's interesting because Buddy is not the guy who's talked about most of the time when the favorites no. come up. It's all about he's, Michael and Terry. He's the one that made that team work. The workhorse. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, do you recall when the first time you would have crossed paths with him would have been? I know he was kind of a journeyman. Buddy? Yeah. Uh, the late 60s. Wow, before, that early. Before I ever got into wrestling. No shit. So he came yeah. into the same territory as your dad, presumably? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jake, I've got to ask while we're here. The Freebirds, reportedly big party guys. Uh, did you ever have an opportunity to go hang out with them? Sure I did. No shit? Oh, Yeah. Like, come we on, party. give us something. Give us something we about party. it. Oh, man. <clears throat> oh, man, I can't think of anything. <laughs> I know they were they were pretty bad, man, on, on, on the road. You know, they were vicious on the road, man. And vicious as far as? To each other. Oh, no shit. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. They're like ribbing. Oh, yeah. They wouldn't like Buddy had to piss. They wouldn't pull the car over, <laughs> you know. They'd make him piss in a the bottle. And then when he'd try to piss in the bottle, they'd hit the brakes and everything. And the piss would go all over him. And then he'd finally get he'd finally get pissed off and just take the bottle and pour it on them. Oh my God. Oh yeah. So they did that. And they wound up doing something. They wound up they wound up getting some squirt guns and filling them with piss. And was shooting, buddy. He thought it was water, so he opened his mouth. Oh, no. He got pissed. So then Buddy got mad and shit in his hand and threw it in the front seat. Wow. Yeah. That was one road trip. You were wait a minute. Okay, I, I was picturing this over the course of a couple of weeks. That was No, that long. was one day. Oh my god. And you were in the car for it? No, no, I wasn't in that car. Oh, thank God. No. And another time they had gotten Buddy good and Buddy was you no know, Buddy had gotten them good and he knew that they were gonna get him back. But he thought it was gonna happen because he had to ride with them. And uh at the last minute Bill Watts asked him if he wanted to fly with him. And said, fuck yeah, I do. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> Bill said, Okay, but there's not enough room for your bag. And Buddy said, no problem. They can take it to the next town. So they said, okay. Well, it was like two or three days before the next town. And uh, they came to New Orleans. And when they walked in the fucking building, I swear to God, there were flies flying in a squadron chasing that bag. Because it stuck so fucking bad. <laughs> oh, God. They brought it into the locker room. Guys were gagging, throwing up. 
just set it in the fucking middle of the floor. Buddy walks in and he smells that and he's like, oh, guys, you're too good to me. He knew right off the bat it something bad was happening. <laughs> and he opened up that fucking suitcase and it was just magnets and a dead armadillo. Oh and God. thousands and thousands of maggots crawling around. And Buddy just reached over there, grabbed his grabbed his under ties, put them on, shook the maggots out of them, put his fucking ties on, <laughs> shook the maggots out of his boot, put his fucking boots on, never said a word. Holy shit. Never said a word. But they finally had to get the bag out of the locker room because people in the audience were getting sick. That strong. That strong. My dad oh. had to go buy like 20 cans of Lysol and just spray the fucking shit out of the whole fucking building. Holy shit. Oh, yeah. It was brutal. I, but I buddy, buddy never sold it. That's the way, right? When somebody oh, yeah. you, you're supposed to oh, no yeah. sell it. No sell it. I pity whoever had to work with Buddy that night when that gear. It was Bill Watts. Bill did. Yeah, and every time Buddy got close to him, Bill just tatered the shit out of him. <laughs> your fucking stinking ass away from me. <laughs> Poor, so it, not only does he get his, his fucking gear screwed up, but now Bill Watts is punching the, the fuck shit out of him. him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, what a business, Jake. Oh, yeah. Could you picture that happening in any other line of work? In no. Flying? No, no, somebody gets shot. <laughs> no question. If it happened today, somebody would get shot. Oh, man, you'll never yeah. see ribs like that in wrestling again, right? Fuck no. It's, it's a shame because it's a hilarious story, but maybe a good thing. Yeah, it is a good thing, man. Um, all right, well, let's move on to Mid-South and your return. At this time, obviously, the relationship with you and Watts is good. Otherwise, he wouldn't be bringing you back, right? Yeah, he just seen an opportunity to make more money off of me. Okay. So he knew I worked he, hard. Had he been seeing then the shit that you were doing in Georgia oh, yeah. and elsewhere? Oh, yeah. He noticed all that. You know, it's interesting because he had all but said that he had no more ideas for you. Um, yeah. The, the last time, whenever he yeah. sent you off to Georgia. Um, so, I mean, when this conversation happens between yourself and Bill, like, how does that go? I never talked to him. No? No. Who is your connection? Your dad? My father. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when you do finally cross paths with Bill, I mean, um, is is he making you any promises as far as no. how it's going to go or creative? None at all. Nothing. Nothing. So you're coming in the door like, I don't know if I'm a heel or a baby face. I'm not sure what I'm doing. Right. And I came, as, came in as a heel. Yep. I left as a baby face. Yep. Now you're so you're walking in day one, uh, and you're like, I'm not sure what I'm doing, I'm not sure if I'm a healer or baby face. You're finding out as you arrive. Yep. Maybe not the way to do it, but no. uh I, I guess it worked. He you, you were yeah, a great you're a great heel down there. Uh what about the territory itself? Did you feel like a lot had changed? Workers, politics, travel, anything? No, nah, it was all the same old bullshit, man. You know, they had the pecking order. You had JYD, you had you had uh, uh, Hacksaw, Jim Duggan, and uh, you had uh, Butch Reed. You had Ernie Ladd. That's a great one. Yep. Terry Taylor. Yeah, Terry Taylor came in later. Yep. So, uh, Jake, at this time, your personal hopes are, of course, to make as much money as humanly possible. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we know that down the road, you'd find a, a groove being a baby face uh, that Heels worked with before getting to Hulk in the WWF. And, yeah. You know, it's, it's good money, and, and that's a good spot to be in. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, though, at this time, what were your creative <coughs> hopes or goals in wrestling? Were you hoping for anything specific? Not really. I was hoping to be a booker somewhere. Okay. That's what I really wanted to do. So that's what happened. I wound up uh, helping Bill with the book in Louisiana for nothing. He didn't pay you extra for uh, it? No. Fuck no. That's, that's passion, dude, that you're taking that on without making more money. Yeah. Yeah, I was. 
when you're coming in the door, are you telling your dad or Bill, like, hey, it's my, I want to be a booker? Yeah. Yeah. And they seem receptive to it right out of the gate? Uh, they were like, uh, we'll see. You know. Um, well, you know, speaking of your dad, we hardly ever bring him up on this show. Um, you know, by this time in your career, you'd achieve a lot of success in wrestling. And I've seen where you've mentioned in interviews before that a big part of your desire to join wrestling was to prove to your dad that you could achieve greater success than he had in the business. And so at this point, I, even now, you know, in your career, I think you could argue that you had, you were were on TV and you'd, you'd made a huge name for yourself. Um, you know, I myself, Jake, have a rocky relationship with my dad, so I understand the weird dynamics with the, between mm. son and father. Uh, th- would you say at this point you and your dad had a good relationship? No. No. No, it was very, it was false. It was behind smoke and mirrors. Okay. Superficial. Yeah. Yeah. Th- was he ever giving you any advice or suggestions? Nope. Never. Never. Have you guys heard the news? The New York Fed just announced that credit card debt hit $1.13 trillion. And while the nation's credit card debt is at an all-time high, yours doesn't have to be. Here's a little secret. Your home value is still likely higher than it was when you bought it. So why not put that equity you've built to work and use it to pay off those high-interest credit cards? Go to savewithconrad.com. Oh, and did we mention skipping your next two house payments? That's right, no house payments for two months. Let the team at Save with Conrad run the numbers and see what's possible for you. Give them a call at 888-425-0105 or go to www.savewithconrad.com today. NMLS number 32416, equal housing lender. Again, it's savewithconrad.com. Uh, so I mentioned that you and Rocky King in your first match back with the company, um, or rather you had had your first match with Rocky King in your first match back with the company. Next, you'd work with Mike Jackson in a TV match. And seeing <laughs> the two of you in the ring together, Jake, was really interesting. Because yeah. uh, Mike is not a big guy at all. No. Um, and you were in there like manhandling him a lot oh, of yeah. times. Like you, you, doing big man stuff and you complete, it was like, I, I just watched this match about an hour ago here before we started recording and you're, you're shoving him around the ring and manhandling him like a oh, yeah. very different style, like a giant. Yeah. Um, what can you tell us about switching in and out of that style? It was just fun to try, you know, to see if I could do it. You know, I've never done that to anybody. And uh, when I seen it, I was working with Jackson. I was like, fuck, this is a perfect opportunity to see if I can do it. Yeah, I think I did a pretty good job of it. Dude, it was it was cool. And you were doing these moves that I never saw you do. At one point, yeah. you get him up on your shoulder. And so he, you've got him up here, and he's like stomach down. And you just drop to your knees with, with like a gut buster on your shoulder. Yeah. And I was like, that's the only time I've seen Jake do that. I'm guessing you never did it again. Nope. <laughs> It was something else, man. And uh, but it, like it was a good match, and Mike seemed like a pretty capable performer. What did you think of him? He he could go, he could wrestle. He always worked hard. He still wrestles for Christ's sake. Yes, he's seventy some years old. Seventy four years old. Seventy four, and still fucking wrestling. I mean, what do you think the secret saw? Because he was he was doing the hard miles and taking all the bumps right along with you yeah. guys. Like, how in the fuck is that guy still going? He's made out of rubber. <laughs> Got to be right. Got to be, man. <laughs> he just wants it so fucking bad, man. And like, he's it's not like you know you say he's still in wrestling. It's not like he's out there working the indies. He's with TNA Wrestling right now. Is he? Yeah, at least uh, last I checked, it was like late 2023. He was with Impact. So like, oh unless he's gone now, he he was on TV. Unbelievable. God bless that man. He's still going. Yeah, God bless him for sure, man. Well, uh, you're also going to work with Tim Horner a few times before yeah. getting to the match that I know a lot of our listeners are going to want to hear about. At the end of January, you're going to work with a very young, very green Shawn Michaels. <laughs> <laughs> and Jake, I'll let you take it from here. Go ahead. What do you have to say oh, God. Oh, that was so horrible. Oh, was, that match stunk to uh, high heaven. I had him in the ring, and I had the arm, had his arm, and I was twisting his arm. 
So I give him the Iggy, which is squeeze, mm-hmm. for him to reverse it. But instead, he just stayed on his knees and went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't get up and reverse it. <laughs> I tried two or three times. Finally, I just jerked him up, clotheslined him, and DDT'd him or whatever I did. <laughs> I couldn't get him to do anything, man. Um, you know, Jake, it's funny to hear that uh, your experience with Sean in the ring was not good because, like, this is a guy that is going to go on to be touted and viewed by many as, uh, and I've heard this said many, many times, the greatest in-ring worker, the greatest bell-to-bell worker ever in business. I've heard people call him the Michael Jordan of wrestling. Oh, um, my God. Yeah, I've uh, I've heard that from a number of people, and Hall of Famers have said that. I mean, uh, at this point in his career, what did you think he was lacking? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> he lacked everything. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, he was he was pitiful. Now, I mean, you know, it's uh, you you said really, and you seem surprised whenever I said, you know, some people call him the Michael Jordan of wrestling. I mean, where do you put Sean now, in future, you know, as as far as his his body of work? Like, do you feel that he was an all time great? I think he was close to being there. Okay. Uh, I don't think he was, uh, I don't put him at the very top. I'll just say that, you know, I don't put him at the very top, you know, with everything considered, you know, um, he certainly didn't draw great money as a champion. And, uh, that's what it's about, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. Just thought that's what I thought it was about. I, I just felt like he was, uh, I mean, he works very hard in the ring and he does a lot of great shit, but as far as believability, hmm, stings a little bit, just quite wasn't there. The, the size was a lot of it too, you know? I, I just I just have a, a hard time putting the championship belt on anybody that weighs two hundred pounds. I got gotcha. you. I really do. When there's guys that weigh three fifty and two seventy five that are ripped, and the belt is on a guy that weighs two hundred, I have a hard time with it. It's, you know, in wrestling, it's, it's, we're asked to suspend our disbelief a lot, but to your point, yeah. Jake, it's, I mean, when we see a fucking monster like Hulk Hogan out there, yeah. I mean, it, 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 compare him to Shawn Michaels. It's like, wait a minute, wasn't Hulk Hogan the champion just a few years ago? And now this guy's champion, right? You know, like so, I said, uh, believability. Yes. I think you ask the people to buy the, to eat a lot of shit sometimes just to get what you want out of it. I'm with you. And, you know, wrestling it used to kind of be built on these larger than life personalities, these guys that are like you see them walking through an airport and you're like, OK, I don't know who that fucking guy is, but he's somebody. Yeah. And that's what all of you guys were back in kind of the golden yeah. age of wrestling. We were bigger and, than life. Yes. And now it's like it, I see people on TV that I'm like, that, that looks like somebody I'd see at the fucking mall. Right. You know? Exactly. Um. Well, so, I mean, did you think that Sean had something at this point? or uh, I, Not at this point. No, not at this point. No. Hard to blame you, especially if you had a bad experience. Um, uh, he was a guy uh, who was a student of the game. He loved wrestling. Did he yeah. seem like a like he was asking for advice? Behind oh, yeah. The scenes? Oh, yeah, he was. He was hungry. He was definitely hungry. Were you able to, to help him out or feed him any info after the match? Like, hey, I did, believe did you I try did. This? I believe okay. I did. I can't remember, but I believe I did. It sounds like something I would do. I was going to say, that's definitely your style is yeah. to say like, hey, who you out there, you fuck this up, but here's how you can improve it. Right. right. Uh, you, during this match, I noticed because I watched this one back right before we started to you're hitting him with some pretty rough shit at times. Um, you at one point he's down, and he's kind of crawling away from you and you put your foot on the back of his head and just fucking shove him with it. Uh, almost <laughs> like, come on, get, get your ass moving. It was a really it, it started it cracked me up because because it was like, OK, Jake is getting frustrated with this fucking guy. Nah, um, maybe I was. Maybe I was, man. I don't yeah, remember. 
who knows? Also, it's I know that you're all about believability and getting heat. So yeah. maybe maybe it, that's just how it works. I uh, roughed him up a little bit. Yeah, dude, uh, you hit him with the short arm cl- arm clothesline at the end, and even Watts commented on it. He was like, "Well, it fucking decapitated him," <laughs> and, it, and it did. You like you really laid it in. Sean, to his credit, did a great job of selling it. I never um, touched him. I, <laughs> you I, I guarantee you, I did not hurt him. It well, goddamn, dude, it looked it looked fantastic. That's the bottom line, isn't it? Yep, you gotta make it look like it hurts. That's it. I've never hurt anybody with that short arm clothesline. That's incredible. Never. Uh, well, he's selling really well here, which is something he's going to become known for. Uh, much like Ricky Morton, uh, mm-hmm. what do you was? What do you think it was that set guys like Sean and Ricky apart in the selling department? Their size and their willingness. Their willingness to get down there and get beat up. Mm-hmm. Something Sean would lose later on. Last question, we'll get out of here, Jake. Um, Another interesting note here that Andrew, our research guy, pointed out, and I completely missed, was that you switched the DDT setup move during this time. Formerly, it was the knee lift that was the move that told us you were getting ready to hit the DDT. Now it's the short arm clothesline. Uh, The change worked, but why make the change? Just wanted something different, man. You know, a short arm clothesline looks so fucking good. You know, and there were less guys that fucked that up and they did the knee lift mm. the knee lift if somebody fucks it up it looks like shit i got gotcha. you so clothesline is pretty fucking simple you know run into this <laughs> <laughs> if you dare <laughs> And what you did to Sean, it, uh, like, man, like I said, it looked like the perfect setup for a finish. Like, you probably could have finished him on the short arm clothesline. <laughs> probably. Well, look, guys, uh, we're going to continue this story, you know, just for frame of reference. We started talking about Mid-South uh, in July 1985 last year. So we kind of picked up in the middle of the story with Jake's time in Mid-South. We want to tell the full story of this run in Mid-South. So we're starting back from the beginning. We'll get caught up to, ju- to July 85 as we move forward here. Uh, just so you guys know, I mentioned it on the last podcast. My wife is getting ready to give birth, and we don't know when this baby is coming, for crying out loud. So Jake and I might be back next week with a with a new episode talking about Mid-Atlantic again. Or uh, we might have to do a backup episode, which I have recorded and in, in the can and ready to go. So we'll see how That's it goes, cool. right, Jake? Good luck, man. Well, it's, uh, I, I'm going to need it, brother. It's me and three girls in this house coming up. You know it's a girl. <laughs> I know I'm getting another girl. You know, you know how to get a boy, don't you? What do I do? You dig deeper. <laughs> I can show you how. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, is we'll we'll get that uh, picture of Michael P. S. Hayes in the room, and I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, guys, just want to remind you all before we go that if you're looking to attract that 25 to 54-year-old male demographic to your product or service, you've got to hit advertisewithsnake.com. Jake is an absolute legend, and he's still on TV. He's still out meeting and talking to fans all the time, and when he speaks, people listen. And believe me when I say that if you want to get your message in front of that demographic, the snake pit is the way to go. If you want some proof that what we do works, just have a listen to our show. We are always advertising for the same businesses because once they advertise with us, they realize that what we do works. Head to advertisewithsnake.com and become a tag team partner with the Hall of Famer, Jake Roberts. JakeTheSnakeShop.com has got all kinds of great collectibles straight from the man himself. Valentine's Day is coming up, and if you're like me, you never have a damn clue what to get for that special someone. Well, if they're a wrestling fan, you cannot go wrong with a gift straight from the master of the DDT himself. Seriously, check it out. He has some great merch on the site, and there's more to come. Go right now to jakethesnakeshop.com. Cameo makes for another great last-minute Valentine's Day gift. It's cameo.com forward slash jakesnake. You can get a personal message, a promo, a birthday wish, a roast, or if you just want to say hi to the legendary Jake Roberts, this is a really fun, easy way to do it. Here's a recent review from Reed. Jake, you should raise your prices. Your mic skills are still perfection, and you really get it regarding what we want from Cameo. You've risen to the top among your elite group of peers once again. 
A cameo from Jake is great for any occasion, guys. Jake loves doing these, and he loves having the opportunity to interact with his fans. So if you've been a lifelong Jake fan, you owe it to yourself to check this out. Again, it's cameo.com slash jakesnake. Go and order yours right now. We just added some amazing new merch to the Snake Pit page at boxofgimmicks.com. To celebrate Valentine's Day, why not represent the greatest power couple in wrestling history, Jake and Cheryl? First, we've got an awesome shirt of the two of them, and underneath it, it says, Trust in Love. And next, maybe coolest, is a recreation of Rick Rude's infamous tights with the airbrush Cheryl Roberts. Seriously, it's such an awesome throwback for wrestling fans. It's a really unique piece from Jake's history in the WWF. You've got to go and have a look at it, guys. It's the Snake Pit page at boxofgimmicks.com. Check us out on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash at Snake Pit Pod. You'll get short clips from the show, some highlights, exclusive content. Again, we did that exclusive episode with Baby Doll, and we've got more to come. So don't miss it. Get over to youtube.com forward slash at Snake Pit Pod and get subscribed right now. Hey, and speaking of YouTube, I've got to do a quick reminder here that if you guys like what Jake and I are doing on the Snake Pit, you've got to check out my other podcasts. First, Ted DiBiase and I have a podcast called Everybody's Got a Pod, and the Million Dollar Man is telling some unbelievable stories after a career spanning nearly 50 years in wrestling. You can listen to it on all podcast platforms, but I strongly recommend that you follow us on YouTube because not only do we have exclusive clips from Ted there, but we also have a YouTube exclusive podcast with WWE Hall of Famer and legend Hacksaw Jim Duggan. And it exists only on the Everybody's Got a Pod YouTube channel. The show with Jim is called The Hacksaw Hour. And it started out as an ad free show exclusive. But Jim and I wanted to widen our audience. So we moved it to YouTube. So you can catch the first eight episodes still exclusively on ad free shows. But every episode moving forward is available only on our YouTube page. And that's not all. Jim is also providing videos of his day-to-day activities. Most recently, we added a video of Jim with his family on the Jericho Cruise, and it is such a blast. Seriously, go and check it out. Get subscribed now at youtube.com slash at everybody's got a pod. If you've enjoyed the Snake Pit, please like, subscribe, leave us a five-star review on all platforms. That helps Jake and I out a bunch. And I have to give you guys a reminder that you can get the Snake Pit and all the other shows in our network early and ad-free at adfreeshows.com. Starts at just $9 a month, which if you do the math, adds up to less than 15 cents per episode each month. I mean, that is a crazy, awesome bargain. Plus, you get tons of bonus content, interactive chats with your favorite hosts and wrestling personalities, and there's so much more. You know, the network is growing and adding awesome new stuff all the time. Recently, ECW legend The Sandman started a new show on AFS. Lex Luger is over there. Kevin Sullivan, David Crockett, and so much more. If you listen to wrestling podcasts and you're not subscribed there, you are missing out on so many incredible stories. Seriously, just go and check it out. Try it out. And I can guarantee you're going to love being part of our community. Again, that is adfreeshows.com. You can catch Jake on X at Jake Snake DDT on Instagram at Jake the Snake DDT and on Facebook at Real Jake the Snake. Follow me at Marcus P. D'Angelo on X and you can follow the podcast at Snake Pit Pod on all social media platforms. Guys, this was such a blast. I love this part of Jake's career. Again, it's another piece of Jake's career that really does not get covered very often. So we're going to do our best to do a deep dive, roll our sleeves up and have a strong look at it every single month moving forward. And we'll catch you guys next week right here on the Snake Pit.